It's Phil's Pop Culture Podcast. Watching television, watching television. A dynamite place to be. Dynamite! Sponsored by Vandalay Industries, importers and exporters of fine latex products since 1992. And now, the man who taught Frank Burns how to eat worms, here's your host, Phil Kahn. And thank you, John Meany, wherever you are. And welcome guests to the latest installment of Phil's Pop Culture Podcast. You know, some people call today's guest a jinx. Others have labeled him a show killer. But I'm here to tell you nothing could be further from the truth. Robbie Rist, a man of many talents, perhaps best known for playing Cousin Oliver on the hit TV series The Brady Bunch, proves in my interview that he is anything but a show killer. In fact, He provides ample evidence that his status as a pop culture icon has helped many projects soar to their greatest heights. I think after listening to our interesting and really fun chat that follows, I guarantee he'll make a believer out of all of you, too. Let's listen in and enjoy. Hi, Robbie. Thanks so much for being on the program today. Phil, why are you ruining my life? We didn't rehearse this, so I'm not exactly sure how that was supposed to come. Oh, no, this is the greatest honor of my entire career. <laughs> yeah, come on, man. I fed you the lines. You almost blew it. Sorry. I, I, I'm, I'm, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it's like I can't help it. I look at my wife and I go, instead of I love you, I'm like, why are you doing this to me? And, you know, it's kind of ruined the moment. <laughs> Wait a minute. I thought that was her line. Yeah. <laughs> no, in her case, it's actually true. Yeah, yeah right? <laughs> We're a burden, aren't we? We're just a burden to women. Oh, good Lord. (laughs) (laughs) We could spend an hour on that, but I want to talk about other things. You up for it? Okay. All right. Now, obviously, I'm going to ask you about, you know, that TV show from back in the 70s, and I'm sure nobody ever asked you anything about it, but I want to skip forward a little bit. Yeah, but that's on the, it's on the resume. You know, I mean, who's the, who's the person, who's the person that was on a thing and goes, yeah, but I don't want to talk about that thing. It's like, it's on the resume. Yeah, I'll talk about the thing. But don't you get tired of people asking? And, of course, for the listeners out there, I'm sure you realize we're talking about the jinx, the show killer himself, Cousin Oliver <laughs> from the Brady Bunch. Don't you get sick and yeah. tired of talking about it? No. I, you know, I mean, I guess, I mean, everybody's got a, a story attached to it. And, uh, and I, you know, it's a... It's a hell of a conversation starter. Oh yeah, you know, uh, you know, you know. I was on a, I was on a beloved American television show, you know. So uh, I, I think it's, uh, uh, you know, I did it, and I mean, it's not like I was on something sucky, right? You know, it's, it's not like I was the, you know, uh, it's not like I was the kid that was brought in for the end of my mother the cough, <laughs> you know. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, you know, I got, I, I was on a, I was on a television show when I was nine, that I'm 55 now, and people are still talking about it. Isn't that amazing? That's, uh, I mean, have you any? I, I mean, I, do the math, but between 1973 and some, when it went off the air, yeah, and now, think about how many television shows have come and gone. And how many people are still talking about? That's a great point. I mean, that's how crazy this thing is. It's true. So you embrace it. That's yeah. cool. Uh, yeah, of course. Yeah, I mean, and I did it more than once. You know, <laughs> I keep I keep trying to market myself as, hey, you know, if you put me in your thing, yeah. just look at my resume. If you put me in your thing, the chances of your thing achieving icon status, uh-huh. it, it's got to go up at least a little bit because it, it happened with Brady Bunch. Yeah. It happened with Mary Tyler Moore. It's a right. show people are still talking about. Happened with the turtle thing. And and it's going to, and it's probably going to happen with Doc McStuffins. So yeah. anybody out there, hey, Quentin Tarantino, you know, if you want to, uh, you know, make one of your movies iconic, we'll see how that goes for you. Put me in it. <laughs> Hey, it worked for Sharknado. It put it right over the top. Forget those other uh, celebrities. You made that. I rest my case. Not only am I in it, but, you know, I wrote all those songs. I, yeah, I'm just saying that 
as I uh, lent my considerable, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the, uh, the weight of my experience and talent. And uh, here we are. Icon, big, big, big cultural pop phenomenon. Yes, you are a cultural pop ph phenomenon for sure. And there's so much <laughs> I want to talk about. Your acting, your music, your voiceover work, etc. But the first plug I want to give you is I want to tell the folks out in listener land how you and I connected last week. You're on a new platform called Cameo. Now, obviously, I know what it's all about because you gave me a Cameo video shout out. But why don't you tell folks about this new endeavor? Yeah, yeah. Cameo is a website where uh, you can uh, hire me to uh, just uh, do like a little quick video presentation thing for you. And, uh, you know, uh, it's uh, there's other popular culture types that are uh, starting to do it as well. I feel as though I, for a change, I might rather than be joining the train when it's already left the station. I feel as though I'm kind of, you know, I kind of bought my ticket ahead of time. Yeah. Oh, it's great, yeah. and the the, the uh, recording you did for me was a lot of fun. You can tell you're having a lot of fun doing them. Oh yeah, you know, I mean, if you have a if, <laughs> performers are show offs. That's all it is. Sure, of course. Performers are show offs, but all of them. You are everybody. You know, yeah. if you had the opportunity, you know, if you put yourself up on Cameo and people were having you do, they you would have a ball with it too because it's performing. You get to you know, you could pull your pants down and show your butt to everybody, you know? <laughs> That's not what we're doing on my cameo thing. Wait a minute. I didn't get to see your butt. You, you've you shown your butt for other videos. Oh, I, man. I, 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 speak, I speak metaphorically, of oh. course. <laughs> oh, okay. I thought I missed out on something there, but, yeah. No, maybe I, no, no, no. And maybe I'm lucky I got missed out on that one. There's, 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 there's really, as far as that goes, there's, not a whole, there's not a very big market for what I'm selling there. So, yeah. <laughs> Me either. But um, <laughs> I'd like to play now the actual cameo recording you did for me. And hopefully that'll, right. uh, that'll get the juices flowing from the listenership out there. And they'll <laughs> go right to cameo.com and, and book you. So let's take a quick listen. Hey, Phil of philspopcast.com. Robbie Rist here, also known as the bringer of death to most Brady Bunch fans who probably feel my getting crushed in Sharknado was justly deserved. Joke's on them, though, as I cannot be stopped. Go, 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 go. Run away from the Sharknado. It's your greatest go, go, go. Go on again. was awesome i was so <laughs> surprised when you sang sharknado for me it was yeah <laughs> that was it's awesome a, you know it, it's the closest thing to a hit record i have so you know it is a hit record and as a matter of fact and, I, and we'll get into sharknado um if you haven't seen the sharknado series you're re really missing out and of course robbie risk pushed it over the top uh the fact that they hired him um and his icon status and now it's a popular culture juggernaut. So it, it really is. It really is. And tell the folks you did you did mu mu several songs for the movie, including the theme song, the Ballad of Sharknado, as you just heard a bit of that rift on the uh, video shout out you gave me. How'd you get involved in it? How'd you write the song? Tell me all about that. I have I've known Anthony Ferrante, gosh, uh, for the director. I, I've known him for uh, twenty some years. And uh, I've done some kind of music and just about everything he's ever done. Yep. I first heard about Sharknado. I was at a, uh, uh, there's a thing out here called the American Film Market, which is kind of a, you know, a convention where uh, uh, people who buy movies and people who are selling movies get together and see if somebody can buy or sell their movie. Okay. And so we, I, while I was there, I, I, I did this, uh, I directed this movie or produced this movie in 2006 called Stump the Band. Uh, you can go to stumptheband.com if you want to see the trailer and even if you want to purchase one. But uh, so we were trying to get distribution for Stump the Band yep. and we passed by the asylum booth and out in front of the asylum booth was this poster of the tornado with the sharks in it. And it <laughs> says, Sharknado, nuff said. 
<laughs> and like the nine year old genre idiot in me just lost his mind. <laughs> I, I, I think I grabbed someone a little, perhaps a little too forcefully by the arm who worked for the company. And I went, excuse me, are you telling me that you're making a movie about tornadoes with sharks in them? <laughs> And the guy looked at me very scared for a moment. And I, I, I apologize for grabbing his arm so hard. And I went, <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> and then I, uh, I, yeah, cause I'm, you know, if it has large insects in it or, you know, any nature run amok and if the lower the budget, the better, I'm, I'm a really big fan of that, that kind of stuff because like, I've made low budget movies and I know what it takes to get a movie done. And if you have no money to get something accomplished, if you can get it done by using spit and Kleenex, mm-hmm. I'm going to have more respect for you than I'm going to have for the person who spent $250 million and had all the resources in the world and their thing just kind of sits there. You make a great point. Uh, anyway, so I, yeah, I was like, oh, this is amazing. It'll, it'll be really, you know, I'm a two headed shark attack guy, you know? <laughs> so uh, I, at the time, Anthony and I were working on music for another movie of his, uh, Hansel and Gretel. Uh, uh, what the asylum does, the production company that makes the Sharknado movies, they do the shark movies, but they also do mockbusters, they call them, which are sort of low budget versions of, of big budget movies that are out there. Oh, I like that. So they did one called American Warships when Battleship came out. Okay. And, uh, you know, it was, it was the same movie, but they did it for $10. <laughs> so, uh, so the, so the asylum also does these mockbusters. And, uh, this one was, uh, Hansel and Gretel, uh, Anthony and I are working on it. And Anthony goes, yeah. I'm like, so what are you doing next? You know, I'm always excited about these movies that he makes. And I'm like, so what's next? He goes, I don't know. The Asylum, they offered me this movie, Sharknado. And I jumped out of my chair. <laughs> I did a lot of that having to do with Sharknado. I jumped out of my chair. I grabbed Anthony by the lapels. Once again, perhaps a little too forcefully. And he <laughs> had this look in his eye like you know, this could go either way. Right, and right. I just said, I don't know why, Anthony. But I believe you have to do this movie. <laughs> this is kismet. <laughs> and 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 Anthony went, uh, oh, and and then uh, <laughs> and then a little later he said, yeah, it looks like I'm doing it. And uh, and uh, then we were off to the races. And primarily, how it works with Anthony and my relationship is that he can't afford Aerosmith, yeah. you know, to license one of their songs for his movie. Mm-hmm. So he comes to me and he goes. I need something that sounds like Aerosmith without sounding like Aerosmith. <laughs> so I have to make an Aerosmith style. Uh, you know, I mean, we in in the movies we do a we do a, a New York New York style song. We do you know, there's some surf in there. Yeah. Like everything you listen to it though, you'd be like, oh, you're stealing from them. I get it. So mm-hmm. it's all it's kind of a a fun you know, spot the influence kind of game. You can play with all this stuff also. And Anthony writes half of it and he sings a bunch of it too. Oh, that's cool. Yeah. We eventually, we have a, we have a whole bunch of EPs out, uh, under the name Quint, the name of the band. Yes. The Jaws character. There's you, there's YouTube Quint and there's Apple, uh, you know, uh, what is it? iTunes Quint has their Quint stuff up there. And so, yeah, go check that out. I mean, the theme songs up there too. Now, I had checked it out, and I, I'm happy to say I'm the proud owner of one of the vinyl copies of The Ballad of Sharknado. When I was talking to Chris Clover, your agent, to set this up, he told me that you have them. It's and a collector's I'll, item, you know. Yes, uh, only 500 have been made, and they're personally autographed and hand-numbered. Why don't you tell people where they can get their own vinyl copy of The Ballad of Sharknado? Oh, oh, Ballad of Sharknado, you can get that through me. Through <laughs> Find you. Me on Twitter or what have you. Uh, or c- uh, contact uh, Chris Clover, my, uh, uh, my, 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 uh, my agent guy. And, uh, uh, yeah, find me. I'm easy to find, too. I mean, I got, you know, YouTube, whatever. You, I got a YouTube channel, and I got a Facebook channel, and they're a Facebook thing, and I got Twitter. So, I mean, I'm not really hard to find. It's such a weird thing about the world that we live in now is that there was a period in history where a, a, a person in entertainment, yeah. the idea was 
to maintain the mystery as long as you could. It's sort of why, you know, it's sort of why Kiss, part of the reason why Kiss was so successful, you know? There, yeah. was, there was this mystery of who are these guys or whatever. Well, that's not true anymore. Now, now it seems like uh, the, the Internet has sort of like leveled everything. And some people embrace it and others don't. You know, you have all these channels where people get a hold of you. I think there are other people that don't want to be bothered, but I guess it all depends on who you are. Well, the thing is, if, if you make yourself available out there, it doesn't become a thing. Nobody feels like they have to now go out and find you. Ah, that's an interesting way to look at it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad I found you. I, I've I've loved you since the moment I first. Well, I'm not love you. I, I mean, respected you. How about that? Well, I've been know, a fan. I'll, I'll, hey, man, I'll, I'll, I'll take it. Whatever. <laughs> what? I've always had a thing for you. Actually, I, I had a crush on Susan, but uh, that's a whole other story. Oh, 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 Phil, we all did. <laughs> Oh, did, now I've met Susan and Mike Lookinland and our friend Jerry Rochelle at Chiller Theater Expo a few times, and I had my picture sure. taken with them. I think you've done that convention, haven't you? I haven't done Chiller yet. No, I'm getting. Uh, I've got. I've got feelers out there for that. Oh, you got to do it. The, the next one is in October. They yeah. just had one this past weekend, but. Um, I couldn't help gush over Susan, you know, I was like a starstruck, like, oh, I had such a big crush on you, blah, blah, blah. And then she's looking at me like, you know, who is this guy? Get him away from me. No, actually, she, yeah. was, she was very nice. But so let's let's mm -hmm. go back a little bit. So you had a little crush on her when you were on the show? Oh, yeah, totally. We, I actually, it lasted well into probably my adult years. Actually. Really? Yeah, yeah. Susan's like, well, you know, first off, she's not the person on the show. Right. You know, she's not, she, there is, there is so little, there is so little of that character, even at, like what that character would be as an adult. Yeah. There's, there's so little of that person in Susan. It's amazing that she comes off as innocent as she does, because she's one of the most wicked people I know in a very, very, I mean, that in the most, you know, glowing of terms. Oh, but, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. I follow her on Facebook and I've met her and she is, she is intense, man. Yeah. Yeah. As, as I grew up, you know, uh, you know, the, 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 she got smarter. So, you know, yeah. Anyway. Yeah. We all, you know, I mean, come on, you know, you, you have somebody on your, it's such a weird thing about television because, well, you know, this, this sort of media thing where you see people in your living room and you kind of think you know them. Right. But the truth of the matter is you don't because that isn't who that isn't them. Right. And so the the initial meeting is always like, you know, between one person's expectations and the other person's expectations of what the expectations of the other person has are. Right. So people are disappointed when they meet you and find out you're not a jinx. Is, is, has that happened? Oh, God. <laughs> people, they're disappointed for a lot more reasons than that. <laughs> we won't go into that here, though. We're, we're going to pretend everybody right. here yeah. loves you and can't get enough of you. I could just, you know, I could give you, like, just, like, maybe just the top ten, not the whole list. Oh, yeah? <laughs> no, I'm joking. I know you are. <laughs> Now, it's funny because, obviously, a lot of people know you as Cousin Oliver from the Brady Bunch. I remember you just as much for a show you were on with Herb Edelman, Big John, Little John. Yeah, that one's getting a, it's, it's getting a little bit of a, of, a, of a revisit every once in a while. There's, you know, there's ripples of that one out there. I was, I, I mean, I, I'm actually kind of amazed that, you know, the Mary Tyler Moore thing doesn't come up very often, but then again... For most people, that would they be in their their sixties and seventies who'd yeah. be kind of into that thing. And I, you know, I don't hang out with that many sixty and seventy year olds yet. So you know, the, mostly it's mostly it's, you know because I go to conventions and things like that. It's people who know turtles. It's people. I mean, Brady's is a weird one because you know because it's a family. You know, it's a kids show basically. Yeah. So like it was like Mary Tyler Moore wasn't on three times a day when it was in syndication. Mm -hmm. You know, it was on, you know, it was on once maybe at night, you know, tonight at 10 o'clock, uh, watch uh, reruns of Mary Tyler Moore where the Brady Bunch was on every day and in some markets three times a day. Yeah. So there were people that were seeing these faces over and over and over and over again. It's crazy. So, yeah. So, I mean, I get, uh, I, 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 Big John, Little John doesn't get 
a lot of love, but there's a uh, there's a crowd out there. There's a big John Little John crowd. <laughs> hmm, I wonder if there's a fan club. I, I maybe I could run for president or something. Hmm. <laughs> there you go. Yeah, I'm sure. I'm sure there is one. It was a uh, yeah. No, we just actually we just lost Christoph St. John from that show. Oh right, right. That was yeah. sad. Ah, oh, I forgot he was on that show. Yeah, terrible news. Oh, that is you terrible. Because the weird thing about that Christoph St. John thing, of course, is that I uh like I may have only talked to him a couple of times when we were adults. Yeah. So forever, I think of him as this adorable 11 year old and that adorable 11 year old killed himself. Uh, it's so strange. It's such a strange thing. It's and so incredibly tragic. It really is. Uh, it's terrible. Yeah. Anyway, but yeah, he was, a uh, uh, he was, a uh, uh, a cast member of that show. Yeah. I'm going to have to go back and look at that. I, I didn't remember that until you just said that. Ah, oh, so sad. Yeah. Yeah. No doubt. And, and Mike Darnell, the kid, the kid who played the son yeah. on the show, on Big and Little John, he invented reality television. Really? Yeah. So he, like, after Big John Little John, he did maybe one other TV movie. But Mike, Mike, Mike loves show business way more than I do. He always has. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and he just, he didn't care that he couldn't be an actor. At a certain point, you know, to me, like, if I couldn't be up in front of people pulling my pants down and acting like a douchebag, <laughs> I chances are I probably wouldn't want to do it. But, <laughs> but Mike just liked being around entertainment. So yeah. the next time I saw him uh, after the show, it was maybe like 10 or so years later. I was in my mid-20s, I guess. Yeah. And, uh, you know, he was working as a page at paramount i was there for a screening or something and we were like, hey how you doing nice to see you blah blah blah, blah. Mm -hmm. next thing i hear he's a, 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 an assistant to a producer at fox and um how 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 much looney tunes knowledge do you have oh i have a lot okay so you know the let's go chase the cat spike the bulldog sure right bouncing around the big bulldog going let's just chase the cat spike let's go chase the okay yeah. that's mike OK, that little bulldog is Mike. Well, it's not him doing the voice. That's just Mike in a nutshell. And and he was on this poor producer 24 hours a day, seven days a week going, hey, man, I really want to produce something. I really want to produce something. Can you only produce something? I want to produce something. I want to produce something. And the guy's like, God, you're driving me fucking crazy. <laughs> By the way, can I swear? Yeah, you can swear. You can swear okay. as much as you like. You're driving me fucking crazy. <laughs> and he goes and finally he just gets sick of Mike. And he goes, all right, genius, here's $25,000. If you can make a pilot for $25,000, I will guarantee that it gets played on Fox. Wow. And Mike goes out yeah. and he finds a whole bunch of found footage shit of animals attacking people. Mm -hmm. And it's called When Animals Attack. Oh, my God. That is amazing. Uh, when Animals Attack became... The biggest, the, the highest viewed show at that point in Fox history. Yeah. And the next morning, everybody was calling him going, so uh, what do you got? <laughs> and, and he goes, well, I have this idea for a game show, and it would be a bridal thing. It's called The Bachelor. Oh, wow. And so like all of these reality shows, when all of this started, were all started by Mike Darnell. That was all Mike. That's Who amazing. Who was on Big John, Little John. <laughs> yeah, crazy. So do you envy him for his success? Because you're no slouch either, Robbie. Come on now. And envy him? No, 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 no. I, you know, as a matter of fact, I'm a little disappointed in him because, you know, I say all the time that it's through no fault of their own, the Beatles ruined music because <laughs> they created a template that everybody now had to follow. Uh -huh. Well, Mike did the same thing with television. Ah. Mike, Mike created to me, and I, you know, I wish him, of course, all the love in the world, you know, luck in the world, and I, 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 I don't begrudge him his success. Yeah. However, what he has done is made our country a whole lot dumber. <laughs> it didn't need much help, let me tell you, by the way. He's made us, well, and, uh, I mean, it's a major slip because... Now there are people that 
want to watch these sort of reality television soap operas, well, reality television style soap operas, mm -hmm. rather than watching something that's real. Yeah. Something that has a, an actual genuine emotional core to it and, 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 and something that'll feed your soul a bit rather than chewing gum for your eyes. Now, hmm. I'm, I'm glad that he's successful. I, I'm, you know, good Lord, I want all my friends to be successful. But at the same time, I'm like, dude, couldn't you have done something smarter? <laughs> so we can blame your friend Mike for, for the Kardashians is basically what you're saying. Oh, God, are you kidding? The line is, the line is, is direct. There are no dots in between. <laughs> yeah. It's just, yeah. You know, no, he started it. He started us becoming dumb. They finished it. Uh, yeah, didn't they? Can I have his phone number so mm -hmm. I can call him up and ream him out for, for this? Yeah, no doubt. Hey, and thanks on the Kardashians thing, dude. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Thanks a lot. <laughs> but I mean, you know, but the other thing is, you know, if it wasn't going to be him, it was going to be somebody else. True. So I'm glad if the money was made, it, it was, you know, you know, metaphorically, it was kept in the family. Yeah, indeed. Now, a lot of people may not realize how much you're into voice acting. Um, people may or may not realize that you played Michelangelo in the 1990 film Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles. If there's anybody that doesn't know that at this point, they have to have been living in a cave. <laughs> All right, anybody out there listening to this podcast right now, if you didn't know Robbie Risk played Michelangelo, I want you to turn this off. Oh, wait a minute. I need as many listeners as I can get. No, no. Keep listening. Turn it, about up. turn it up louder. I want you to open your windows and run out and yell, I'm not going to take it anymore. <laughs> the, uh, yeah, it's, uh, it's uh, I mean, I, a voiceover I started doing in my mid-20s or something. I was, with a, I was with an agency that had a print department commercial department, a voiceover department, and a young person's department, mm -hmm. of which I was a member or a, a stable mate there. And uh, they, whenever they needed young people voices for the voiceover department, they would bring us upstairs and we'd do the thing, go back down. And uh, I started picking up all these voiceover jobs. And I was like, wait a minute, are you telling me I can get up at 10 a.m.? Be at a job by 1130. I'm out of there by 1230 and I have the rest of the day to like, I don't know, just be a douchebag. Great. <laughs> you know, so and and so I and for like 25, I mean, still now I, I just I just got off of uh, five years on Disney's Doc McStuffins show. That's amazing. And uh, so, like, I've been doing that the entire time. Uh, primarily, I'm actually trying now to try to do on camera stuff again. I'm just starting to kind of poke my toes in there and, you know, get in front of the camera again. Oh, don't, don't bother. Yeah. You can have a cameo every once in a while. Like, you know, when you played the bus driver in Sharknado that got crushed to death. And... Well, yeah, but I mean, you know, I, I didn't really have to read for it. You know, <laughs> Anthony was like, Hey, you want to be in the movie? I'm like, yeah, fuck yeah, sure. I'll do it. <laughs> You know, yeah, no, I, I mean, I didn't really have, to, I didn't really have to win that one, you know. Right, right, right. That's that's part of the thing. So, yeah, I want to get back into it and see what sort of trouble I can cause. And hmm. uh, you know, I mean, I'm just at this point, I, I just realized, you know, I've been an artist in since I was six. Yeah. And I don't think that's going to change anytime soon. So rather than concentrate on a couple of art forms like I've been doing my entire life yeah. i've decided that i'm going to do a lot of things so one of them is uh, do it trying to do the on camera thing again i'm writing a comic book no i'm kidding. uh working on a, a pilot with mason reese i'm uh uh i'm doing uh yeah a lot of a lot of my uh, my wife and i we're we're working on a on a thing that we're going to do just for a Sort of a web, you know, a web series thing. So, like, cool. I'm just like, I don't know. Let's, I'll write. I'm going to produce. I'm going to act. I don't give a shit anymore. I'm, you know, I'm, I'm done waiting for the mountain to come to Muhammad. You know, I'm, I'm going to the mountain. I'm going to look, people. Good for I'm you. I'm not sure exactly how that. I'm not sure how that metaphor, that allegory metaphor, actually works. But you understand what I'm saying. I understand what you're saying. Now it's funny. Before we went on the air here. Uh, we had talked about Mason Reese. I know that you had worked on a show of his called Life Interrupted. Mm -hmm. And it was funny. Your character's name was Oliver. I thought that was pretty cute. Um, yeah. Well, yeah, well, like, yeah, because it was a fucking accident. 
<laughs> right, right. They just happen to name it. Yeah, right. Yeah. You mean that was no planned? kidding? I read for it. I'm like, are you kidding? The character's name is Oliver. I got this. <laughs> I got this. <laughs> so you're doing a new project, a different project with Mason. Can you give us a little more? We're doing a, a, a drama, a drama series. Uh, uh, we just we're just finishing up the script, but uh, it's uh, uh, yeah. It's a hopefully we're, we're it's going to be hopefully like an HBO kind of you know hour long series thing. Cool. So yeah, as we get closer, as we get closer, I'll you know we'll be more forthcoming with details. But yeah. in the meantime, oh, that's cool. Well, you really have a lot going on. I, yeah. I do want to get back to the voiceover work because uh, Chris Clover was telling me that do, do you actually give like voiceover lessons or you have a recording studio? You, you... Yeah, yeah, yeah. I have a I have a a, a school I call Ten Thousand Hours uh, because uh, everyone is an expert if they do something for ten thousand hours. I think I got about seventeen thousand hours under my belt. So um, uh, yeah, I mean I do people's voiceover demos and I'm uh, that's another thing I'm doing. I'm like I'm. I'll teach too, uh, you know, whatever. I'm just, I'm in entertainment. I'm not going to be doing anything else. So, you know, maybe I can use this experience that I've had to sort of pass some stuff on to people and maybe, you know, cut down the amount of time it takes between starting something and actually doing it professionally. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people, I think in, in general, a lot of people, kind of wander around in the weeds for a while before they really figure out what they're doing uh, with anything new. That's true. And, uh, you know, yeah. So my thing is, you know, I'll, 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 I could probably get you to cut a couple of rungs off the ladder that you're climbing. Hmm. And how would people get in touch with you for like, you know, if they want some voiceover lessons or some help, is it again, just like find, just find you. There's a 10,000 hours site. So, uh, yeah, just look up 10,000 hours, vo.com, I think it is. Okay. I'm sure people will find it. Um, yes, sir. <laughs> but, uh, yeah. So, and I, yeah, like I said, I do demos. I can, I can teach, you know, in, in Skype, you know, I can do all that. So mm -hmm. even if you're not in Los Angeles, uh, we can do it, you know, anywhere. So. Well, I'm in upstate New York. So so you're telling me that is there like a guarantee that you can set me up like the life you were describing where like I wake up at 10 o'clock and I go in and work from like 1130 to 1230 and, and then I roll in the dough like you? Is there any kind of guarantee you give? No, 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 of course not. Listen, those days are over for me. I have to work for every goddamn thing I get at this point. <laughs> Damn. You know, but the, well, and also, though, you know, if you're going to be in, if you're going to be in art, if you're yeah. going to be in the art world at all, yeah. don't do it to make money. You will, your life will be so unhappy. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I, I do art because it's what I've always done. Yep. And, and it's not a, uh, you know, <laughs> it's, it's a little, in my case, it, it ended up being a little like the priesthood. I was like, oh, I like, you know, showing my butt to people. And uh, all of a sudden, <laughs> I was like, I want to show my butt to everyone. <laughs> the priesthood. Hmm. <laughs> all entertainers are that little kid who, the second they realize they did something that made people laugh. Yeah. The minute that little light went on, all entertainers have that. They have that moment where you're like, ooh. I have a weird, I'm a three-year-old with a weird kind of control over people. Yeah. That could become intoxicating, huh? And, and then you end up like me where it just wrecks your life. It did wreck your life, didn't it? No, come on. Oh, God. You've led a charm over. life. You've done a little bit of everything. I mean, you're on a podcast right now. You have your own podcast. No, no, I'm remarkably lucky. Uh, yeah, I, I, uh, I actually can't believe they haven't kicked me out of entertainment yet. But, you know... As long as they keep hiring me, I'm not going to complain. Yeah, yeah, that's another thing. Uh, you know, I say don't specialize. I have a podcast called myself called The Spoon. You can find us at thespoonradio.com. It's uh, where yours sort of focuses on popular culture and things. Uh, yeah. We describe ours as uh, playing with a cat with a laser pointer. <laughs> we, it's like it's total ADD theater. And uh, and it's all just really a big improv exercise, but uh, sometimes really funny things transpire. So 
That's cool. I actually just put a link up on my website to it. We're making a comedic radio drama this year also. Ooh, I like that. Yeah. I heard radio is on the comeback. Yeah, I think it is. Well, you know what I mean. A, a, a piece of audio. I call it a radio drama because I'm old. Right, right, right. <laughs> what are you, 56? 55, yeah. yeah. I'm 55. Yeah, who's older? I wonder, are you older than me? When, when's your birthday? April 4th. Ah, oh, mine's August 22nd. 63? I am. So you're actually, you're older than me. Wait, are you 63 or 64? 64. Oh, I'm older than you. Yes. Yeah, sorry. I was, I was just calling you old, and I'm older than you are. Never mind. But the funny thing is, though, is that your voice is really useful. Thank you. I try. Yeah. Oh, do you really? You try to make it so when you hang up, you're going to be like, well, I'm so glad that's so great. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> the, the, that goddamn facade is sounding like a young person. <laughs> That's absolutely right. <laughs> Honey, my lumbago. Yeah. <laughs> right, my lumbago. <laughs> I don't even know what that means. My shingles are acting up again, honey. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Damn yeah. shingles. But no, it's true. You're, how long have you been doing the uh, this broadcasting thing? Uh, I've done this show for about a year and a half, but I have done some radio in the past. I've had my own sports talk radio show locally in upstate New York, so I've dabbled in it. Certainly nothing to the extent that you've done. but Where, but where in upstate New York? It's called Saratoga Springs. Have you heard of Saratoga? It's the home of the uh, United States' oldest horse racing track? Yes, of course. Oh, you have heard and of the it. Reason I know, the reason I know about it is because... Do you know who Carl Ballantyne was? Why do I know that name? Carl Ballantyne, he was a magician, but he was also sort of a television personality. Oh, but yeah. he got he got famous as a as a magi- you know, as a magician. That was sort yeah, of his yeah. original gig. Well, he had a daughter named Sarah. Okay. And Sarah's full name was Saratoga Springs. No way. Yeah. Really? Yeah, he loved horse racing so much he named his daughter after the track. <laughs> hmm. <laughs> yeah, I guess he was quite a fanatic, huh? Very. Yeah. So yeah. So I'm. 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 Uh, so where are, are you near Syracuse? Uh, sort of about three hours away from Syracuse. Three hours east, I'd say. You'll have to come visit sometime. I I have a couch that pulls out into a, a bed. You can you can crash here. Well, right on. Well, I have uh, let's see. Uh, a very close friend of mine lives in Kerhonkson, okay. which is a little further south of you. That's about an hour and a half out of New York. Yeah. And uh, yeah, I I, you know, I get to you know you be, you do the entertainment thing for a long time. You know people all over the place. Sure. You know yeah. Great. Well, I guess I guess actually now everybody knows everybody all over the place. But it's true because we're all connected you know it's yeah. true and i mean i gotta say even this this uh, interview right here i mean you know i grew up and i'm a kid of the 70s and i love pop culture and i consider you know the uh the danny partridges and and the mr brady's and the oscar and felix's of the world like you know the people i grew up with and you were one of them and it's like gee lo and behold hey i have a chance to actually connect with and have a conversation with robbie wrist isn't that cool that we're back to that access thing that's, i know. You know that's just that's what it is i mean uh, it, it, there was a time in history where if you had a summer job and yeah. you made a friend at that summer job yeah. chances are when that summer job was over maybe it was a couple of letters and you never saw them again it's true now even if you want to get rid of people, it, it, you can't. It's true. Every, you know, yeah, I mean, everybody's really easy to find now. I mean, you know, really, how many people do we have to get rid of? I guess that's why they have restraining orders. But <laughs> right, right. <laughs> other than, yeah, yeah. Uh, but other than that, it is, you know, everybody can find everybody now. It is so true. And, you know, I, what prompted me to start this podcast was I was actually reading an article about Mo Howard from the Three Stooges. It was at the end of his life. Mm-hmm. And a fan of his, obviously this is well before the Internet, a fan of his went out of his way to look him up, got his home address, and just wanted to meet him. You know, if if this were today, he would Google him and lo- or look him up on Facebook and befriend him, and then they're buddies. But he went out of his I way. Think it was, I, think it, I think it was Billy West. Well, is it Billy West? 
I believe it's Billy West who did that. Yeah, because oh. he then said, hey, do you, do you have Larry's phone number? And then he, he gave him Larry's phone number. I think you're right. I think you're right. It's all coming together now. He said, he said I'll give you Larry's phone number. This will piss him off. <laughs> but that was so cool. I mean, you know, and. Oh, yeah. Here's this guy at the time who was almost forgotten and, and an icon. Those and huge overtures no, to, to get close to those sort of people back in the day. And it was also considered somewhat nerdy. Oh, absolutely. I'm sorry. It was considered it was considered nerdy at a time when uh, like nerdiness was bad. Yep. Now nerdiness is good. Is nerdiness they, good? The, the, the nerds, the nerds won the culture war. Like just, <laughs> I mean, they just slayed everybody. So that means I'm winning because it's because I was thinking I would love to interview Robbie Rist. I loved him as Cousin Oliver and all the other things he did. Oh my God, well I have a so that makes me a nerd. But but it's a good thing, is what you're saying? Oh, it, it is now. If it was 1978, maybe not so much. <laughs> but now it's an accepted norm. You know, yeah, because I mean, think about back then. If you were caught on the street with a 12-sided die in your pocket. You know, it could mean a serious beating. Yeah. And and that's not true anymore. Yeah. You know, I I, 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 I play in a bunch of bands also. And I, so I, I play with this band called The Mockers. They're from Virginia. But originally, they were from Spain. So we've gone to Spain a lot of times. And I was there on one of these trips. And the, I was talking to this guy who was like, you know, he said, after like all of these years, Spain is starting to get conventions. Okay. And I was like, you know, fan conventions. I'm like, oh, you know, it's kind of cool. And uh, and I said, so in the fandom world, what's the, been the biggest change, do you think? And he looks at me, and his eyes got really wide. And this is a guy in his middle 30s. And he looked at me with his eyes wide, and he went, there's girls. <laughs> so, yeah, and a lot of them yeah. were wearing, like, you know, provocative clothing and doing cosplay and things like that. The cosplay thing is the best thing that could have happened to anybody. That Absolutely. That sort of thing. Oh, my. I went to a Comic-Con this, this past weekend, and oh, my God. Uh, hey, look, it's a slave lamb. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, it's awesome. Now, speak, speaking of which, I know you're going to be appearing at several conventions. Uh, Chris again asked me to ask you about ones that you have coming up. Guy, that guy's super motivated. Yeah, he's a, yeah, he's very friendly, but like, good heavens. Like, sometimes I have to kind of go, dude, I only have 24 hours in the day. <laughs> but it's amazing. Yeah, no, no, you can't, uh, you can't buy a Chris. We're very, uh, we think having a Chris is a good thing. Oh, Chris is terrific. He's been very friendly, very yeah. helpful. Well, right on. Good. Yes. Yeah, so, yes, Vision Con coming up May something, 10. May 10th, and that's in Missouri. That's in uh, that's in Missouri. Let's see. I got to go over the list real quick to see if I caught everything. Da da da. Sharknado. Da da da. Uh, Ted Baxter's son on the Mary Tyler Moore show. Let's see. Oh, you yeah. were on Lucas Tanner. You were on three episodes of The Bionic Woman. We just lost Georgia Engel on on in my in my uh, history yeah. of working with hot moms. Yeah. I, believe it or not, Georgia Engel rates very high for me. Really? You had a thing for Georgette, huh? Yeah, I, well, because also she's like Susan in that the person who she portrays on television yeah. is not who she is at all. No way. See, I, I wouldn't have guessed that. She had the filthiest mind, that woman. I, oh, that's I, awesome. I had, uh, yeah, I had nothing but, re nothing but respect for that. Yeah, losing uh, – yeah, you know, it's funny that, well, you and I being close in age, yeah. it's – we're getting to the point now where these parts of our childhood, like like deciduous teeth or something, are starting to fall away. Yeah, it's true. So like all of like the things, a lot of the people that we grew up with are like, and then there are people who are our John Singleton. Yeah, fifty one. John Singleton is fifty one years old. Yeah, which means. When I was 21, yep. I'd be like, dude, I can't hang out with you. You're 17. Yeah. You know? And, yep. and so, it, it, you know, we're getting to that point where our, our, our popular culture heroes are, you know, I mean, 
look, I, I, in a way I feel lucky <laughs> that uh, this isn't as cruel as it sounds, but I feel lucky that both John Lennon and Freddie Mercury died when they did, at least for my own mortal, my own contact with my own mortality. I can see that. Is that I, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid of uh, like those two people sort of helped me go, you know, it, it, dying is a thing that happens and it, it's, it's terrible and tragic and it happens so young. Yeah. But, you know, the thing is, it's, uh, uh, I, what am I trying to say? Uh, that, that I, I, I'm not, uh, here's what it is. I'm not completely devastated by watching my childhood go away. I've been watching my childhood go away for a while. That's that's interesting. I, I'm feeling just the opposite. It's it's like yeah, sure, people died when I was younger, but a lot of my contemporaries are now starting to pass, and the, and the mortality has been hitting me in the face. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, you know, this is uh, I think this is the decade where you sort of get that crap in order. Uh huh. Like one of the great well, for me, one of the great things about turning fifty was. I no longer felt I was somehow beholden to other people's feelings or anything. Mm. Now, I still want to be a good person. I still want to be nice. But if somebody gets their feelings hurt by something that, you know, I really had no control over or what have you, it's, it really has become like, oh, that's terrible news for you. So now uh, I, I think the next thing is, is that we're having this discussion about the next phase. Yeah. Because now is the time to go, all right, I'm stealing myself in for a big fight here. Because from what my dad told me, uh, age is not for the weak of heart. It's true. My mother used to say, yeah. you know, the golden years, That's that there's no such thing. They're not golden at all. They're miserable. <laughs> <laughs> well, also, our, our parents' generation didn't take as good a care of themselves as we did. Well, speak for yourself. I don't take care of myself at all. I'm just as bad as they <laughs> are. <laughs> <laughs> but no, we we are. I mean, we're, you know, our food is less processed and, you know, I mean, hopefully, I mean, it's out there if we want it. But right. I think like definitely, you know, a lot of a generation or so above us, they had a lot of health problems because they ate steak every day for 30 years. That's true. You know, so and that's going to, you know. That's going to cause an issue. At some point, <laughs> that's going to cause an issue. <laughs> Let's talk about Betty White, who is 90-something now. God bless her. And just and, – and still, look, uh, she's – I think she's more with it at her age than I think Betty Davis was at hers. Yeah. <laughs> you know, she's yeah. still hanging in there really hard. A lot of those, you know, old. a lot of those older actor women are just – getting more and more kick ass as time goes on. They sure are. And that brings to mind another person. Um, I've heard really interesting things about the late Florence Henderson, that she was quite the wild one and not not quite a Mrs. Brady. Is, is she another one that, that kind of like George Angle and, and Susan Olsen? No doubt. I mean, you can see her, you know, you can see everything that she's about uh, when uh, I did a Weakest Link episode with the Brady people. Oh, yeah. You were the first one that got canned. Yes. Uh, uh, Phil, thanks for reminding me. So, yeah. anyway, <laughs> I was, uh, so, uh, so, but the thing is, in the intro of the show, she goes, uh, my name is Florence Henderson, and I'm 29 years old. And then she looks over and she goes, what? That's her. <laughs> oh, that's great. That is great. Yeah, that's who Florence was. You know, I, it's it really is funny that both her and you know, if you watch the 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 joke versions of them from the Brady movies, yeah, they. I say this about that time a lot. You know, uh, uh, the Brady Bunch existed in a guileless time mm -hmm. where we could watch incredible cheese and accept it at face value. It yep. just was what it was, and it did it did so unapologetically. Yeah, and it it did so it did so with it did so with zero awareness that it was doing it. Yep. Okay, it was just part of the thing that they were making, and uh, around uh, well, the minute Bill Murray looked in the camera and went Star Wars, <laughs> and Star Wars, the minute that happened, <laughs> yeah, 
the Brady Bunch turned into something else because it was actually this really innocent show. Yeah. Back in the day. You know, um, do you know the song Claire by Gilbert O'Sullivan? Sure. Okay. So Claire, when it came out, was a gently sweet song about a, a, a guy who was watching his brother or sister's kid. Mm -hmm. Now, if you listen to that song, a little part of you could let the thought that there's something creepy about this song sneak in there. Ah. And that's because we don't have that sort of Carol Brady delivery that, oh, now kids. Yeah. That that doesn't exist irony free anymore it did then isn't that interesting you brought up a great point about the brady movies um you know the brady movies were only like let's say 20 years or so after the show it's not like it was 100 years later but the way they played it where you know the the brady family were still in the 70s and yet it was the 90s and and the contrast there and it was really well done, and sh and is make and has proven your point. Oh yeah, yeah, no, that's very much no. That's where the Brady Bunch, uh, actually, the Brady Bunch at that moment took it back. They bas they basically went, oh, you've been calling this a kitschy, goofy television show for the last, you know, however long you've been watching the reruns. Well, we're way ahead of you on this. <laughs> and then they. And then they made a very self-aware parody of this thing that they originally did that wasn't self-aware. That's, yeah, that's brilliant. Yeah, it is. Yeah, no, I, you know, uh, uh, Sherwood Schwartz, he, he, the guy wasn't dumb. He was a really smart dude. And I'm not that anyone says that he is, but I mean, he was a pretty smart guy. Yeah. And he, you know, he had, he'd been bouncing around entertainment for a while. Mm-hmm. And he's got two bona fide classics under his belt. He's got Brady Bunch and Gilligan's, Gilligan's Island. Island. Sure. Yeah. So you know that guy. And I, yeah, I never asked Lloyd this, but yeah, I, I, is the, I wonder if the uh, internet rumor about Gilligan's Island being about the seven deadly sins. Oh yeah. I wonder if that's a real thing. I wouldn't be. I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, I wouldn't either. That's what I mean. There's there's a certain kind of. You know, that's what I mean. There, there, there's levels to what those guys were doing. So. <laughs> yeah. Let's see if it, if they were the seven deadly sins, which one would you have been? Oh no, 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 the Gilligan's Island were the seven deadly sins. Yeah, I know, I know. But if if you were on Gilligan's Island, which which one would you be? I'm wondering. Oh, oh, who would I be? Oh, well, let's see. Probably the way I'm shaped, I'd be the captain. <laughs> but um, you know, although I gotta say, in most of my life, I feel like I'm Marianne. Do you now? Yeah, you know, I can uh, I can definitely watch a, a show and uh, you know the, and find a character I identify with. And sometimes I'm like, yeah, I know it's a girl, whatever. You know, <laughs> the helicopter pilot in uh, Avatar. You know, yeah, just like I'm like, yeah, I'd, I'd be with her. I'd be, yeah, that's uh, <laughs> that's the character I'd be. Well, this has been a true pleasure, Robbie. I'm I'm so thrilled I had a chance to connect with you. I've loved your work forever. Well, thank you. I appreciate it. And you know, we'll do it again. And you know, if you're if you're amenable, we can have you on the spoon. Oh, that would be great. Cro cross promotion. Oh, I like that. It's the wave of the future. I understand that the kids are doing with this whole podcasting thing. Yeah, those kids, and uh, we need Man. to blaze our own trail. Let's not follow their. Okay, yeah, let's cross from Rome. <laughs> I can't blaze their trail any, uh, anyway. I mean, they move too quickly. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again. My pleasure. And uh, hey, thanks for buying the single. I really appreciate it. Ah, I can't wait to get it. Thanks, Robbie. Take good care. You too. Bye. I'd like to thank today's guest, Robbie Risk, for an engaging, enlightening, and really fun conversation. Robbie, just like Florence Henderson, Susan Olson, and Georgia Engel, it was terrific to learn you're nothing like the jinxed kid you played on TV way back when. You've lived a hell of an interesting life, and I'm so glad you shared some of it with us today. Stay well, my friend. Watching television, watching television. We hope you've had a dynamite time listening to this edition of Bill's Pop Culture Podcast. Join us again next time for another stroll down memory lane. Until then, let's be careful out there.
watching television, watching television. Hands coming over, we won't have to talk. Let all the bright lights come out of the box. Ooh. Watching television, watching television.